After working on my 2D Metroidvania Summit for exactly one year, I wanted to share with you some knowledge I've gained over the course of working on the game for quite some time. In this video I will open the project in Unity and walk you through some aspects I think might be interesting, especially if you plan on building a similar game. This video is more of a summary and covers a lot of different topics, but if you're interested in more details, I will definitely consider making more videos where I can go into great detail on the individual parts of the game's development. Arguably the most important part of any 2D platformer is a solid character controller. It's almost impossible to spend too much time on nailing the physics and feel of your character, it's also crucial to finish the core movement and abilities as early as possible and before doing any level design for obvious reasons. In retrospect, I'm rather satisfied with how my character physics turned out and I'm glad I spent at least a few full days tweaking my core physics inside this black box environment without any visual distractions. Two of the core mechanics in my game, which I knew from the start on, are wall climbing and the grappling hook. Over the course of development I spent a lot of time on only these two and I added many details like hoisting, pulling up walls, enhancing the grappling hook by combining multiple different joints and playing around with the player's release velocity. Unity's physics engine Box2D is great and I wouldn't want to build a 2D game without it, but especially for character physics don't be afraid to mess around with the physics on your own. Town maps have been the most popular form of representing 2D environments since the early days of the genre. In the NES days, one big reason for using tile maps was obviously optimization and to minimize file size. Nowadays, we don't have these limitations anymore, but tile maps still prevailed as a really good tool for 2D games, especially platformers. I personally had two main reasons for using tile maps. First, building environments is really fast. Unity's 2D tools have evolved to be pretty powerful over the last years. Among those is the powerful tile map editor, which lets you place tiles on a grid in a really efficient way. And second, level design is more straightforward. So having everything aligned on a grid is great for 2D platformers, where precision is super important. For instance, if I know that the player's character can jump three tiles high, five tiles wide, I can easily build the levels and platforming sections around that. One of the biggest time savers for me was to use rule tiles, a feature which is included in Unity's 2D uh, extensions package. Rule tiles are special tiles which automatically shape into the correct visual tile depending on its position and its neighboring tiles. You can basically define a list of rules, each resulting in a different tile to be displayed. This is similar to 9 slicing, which is often used for sprites that should be flexible in width and height. Rule tiles are extremely powerful and I couldn't imagine building a larger 2D world without them. I can just paint an entire area with a single rule tile, where otherwise I would have to manually pick the right ones for ledges, corners and so on. For each tile set, I use two different rule tiles, the main one containing all the solid tiles and a second one containing a thin decorative uh, padding around. Initially, I had both in one rule tile, but the rules turned out to get extremely complicated and some situations were even impossible to represent, I thought. Also, it was pretty awkward to place because you had this one tile padding. Another cool thing about tile maps in Unity is that you can use the very clean composite collider which essentially combines all the individual tile colliders into one connected collider. This is great for performance and also eliminates weird glitches where objects can get stuck between colliders. The cleanest solution, which I also used, is to set the type to outlines, which essentially means you have connections of lots of individual edge colliders. The only major drawback of this method is that since the colliders are only solid on the edge, Objects can easily glitch into the tile map when getting pushed by some other object. This is generally a problem in many games and it's often exploited in speedruns. I haven't found a good way to fix it yet other than placing solid safety colliders at critical locations. 
As I've said a few times in my devlogs, background and foreground decoration is generally easier if you have more closed narrow areas, like caves. In my case of the mountain, though it's the exact opposite, so I struggled for some time to find a good solution for a coherent background. I'm using a perspective camera, in contrast to an orthographic camera, which is the default for 2D games. There is the advantage that you can easily create parallax effects using the C-axis, since in perspective projection, objects that are further away from the camera implicitly appear smaller and move slower. Although when starting the project I didn't anticipate how large my world would actually become, I still knew it's gonna be an open world and I wanted a scalable solution. Among the first things that came to my mind was scene management. While you can put everything into a single scene in Unity, it's generally not good practice for larger games because you can't easily load and unload certain parts from memory. So from the start on I tried to separate chunks of my world into individual scenes. Each scene contains objects that are related to this chunk like the tile map, decorative objects and enemies. Objects that don't belong to certain parts of the world are placed in the main scene. These include the player character, the camera and all global scripts like the game manager. The main scene is also Unity's active scene, while all the level chunk scenes are loaded additively. For convenience I've written a few editor scripts which allow me to load and unload entire areas in the game, which essentially just loads and unloads all scenes inside given directories. My initial premise was that at some point, as the world grew bigger, I needed to implement a solution to dynamically load only relevant chunks of the map. However, it turned out that the game can easily handle my entire world at once, which are currently 59 scenes, so I didn't bother with that. I've tied several other pieces of information to the chunks, like background music, ground type, camera zoom or light intensity. In order to be aware of which chunks the player enters and therefore which music to play, which camera borders to use, etc., I have placed triggers at each location where the player can pass from one chunk into another. In my world I have several houses and other indoor areas which the player can enter via doors. These indoor areas work exactly like the chunks, just that they are somewhere off the map and the player is teleported to their entrance point when entering the specific door. This obviously works both ways, so the player can exit the same way. I don't know if that's the most beautiful way of implementing such a system, but at the time it seemed like the easiest way and so far I haven't come across any problems with it. Serialization, which is creating a safe game and restoring it in ideally the same state, is a major topic in the development of most games. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as just writing save and load in Unity. You actually have to think very carefully about what parts of the game need to be serialized and what can just be reloaded with the scene. Luckily, in my case, the majority can just be reloaded to a big part thanks to my early design decision that the game can only be saved at certain locations, in my case, the campfires. Furthermore, I used what I would call a subtractive approach, meaning that initially most of the game objects are part of the scene, and as the player interacts with stuff, more and more objects are removed. I have a persistable component, which I put on objects that need to be serialized if the object is then destroyed during gameplay. For instance, if a herb is harvested, the persistable sets its life flag to false. When the game is loaded, the persistable component then checks whether its object is still alive and if not, it just destroys it right away. A similar approach is used for objects which have a boolean state like switches for example, or objects which have a slightly more complex state like NPCs. In retrospect, the simple solution which I've implemented rather early on has pretty much stood the test of time and I had to spend far less work on serialization as I expected. Since I intended to create all the game's art by myself, I anticipated that it will probably take up the largest amount of time in the entire project. So I really needed an art pipeline which was as fast as possible and still looked decent. 
40 yard style. I knew I would use the flat style, which I've worked with in the past. I've created all original assets using Inkscape, directly exporting to Unity as PNGs. A few months in, I decided that I wanted a little bit of texture, especially on larger objects. So I added in a step where I put some light texture on the surfaces using Photoshop. For the characters, of which there are exactly 45 at the time by the way, I chose Unity's PSB and 2D animation workflow. I started again in Inkscape, creating the character and separating its body parts into different SVG layers. I then had to do the awkward step of opening the SVG in Illustrator, just so I could export it as a Photoshop PSD, which I then opened in Photoshop to export it as a PSB, which is the format that Unity's 2D animation package requires. These conversions are the only annoying parts and if I could just export directly out of Inkscape the workflow would be really awesome. Anyway, the PSB can then be opened with Unity's sprite editor where I can rig the character. After having rigged a few characters I could most of the time just copy and paste the rig to new ones. The weight painting usually worked out of the box, sometimes I had to make some adjustments with the bone influence. After that the characters were ready for animation, which is also nicely integrated into Unity. All in all, Unity's 2D character workflow is really good and especially if you're drawing your characters in Photoshop, you could just work directly with the PSB and avoid the annoying export stuff. I hope this video could give you a little overview over the individual parts that make up my 2D Metroidvania so far. It barely scratches the surface on most topics, but as I said, I'd be pretty happy to create some more in-depth content in the future. If you're further interested in the game's development and the incremental improvements that brought me here, be sure to check out my previous devlogs. And if you're also interested in playing the game, check out my Steam page and consider wishlisting the game. Hope to see you soon for some more behind-the-scenes game development. Until then, have fun creating! Oh.